So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Sol, uh, Sol Iglesias. I'm an assistant professor of political science at the University of the Philippines here in Diliman. And I'm very pleased to welcome you to this um, event of uh, Phil S4. Uh, this is the uh, this is an initiative of uh, the Sydney Southeast Asia Center, the, Uni the University of the Philippines uh, in Diliman, where I am, and the City University of Hong Kong. So the seminar series is a is a monthly series on Philippines. Uh, to bring together a diverse group of experts uh, across the world uh, with shared interests in understanding from the Philippines, Philippine politics, culture, history, and so on. So um, uh, we're very pleased to, to welcome uh, Berman Scoggins, who is our speaker today. He's a fourth year PhD candidate in political science at at the School of Politics and International Relations at the Australian National University. His work is on uh, political behavior. He focuses on understanding why voters in democracy sometimes support illiberal and undemocratic politicians and how they might be persuaded to vote uh, democ uh, democratically or in favor of democracy. He's currently on. Uh, he's currently an instructor and visiting researcher at Nazarbayev uh, University in Kazakhstan, and uses survey re experimental methods to analyze public attitudes towards democratic reform in authoritarian societies. All right, Vermin, uh, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Sol, and thank you very much to the Phyllis Four Organizing Committee and the sponsors um, of. Uh, the seminar. So I'll just start sharing my screen. Okay. Uh, thank you very much uh, to everybody uh, who is uh, attending. Uh, it's great to be presenting uh, my research uh, to you. Uh, so if you've uh, had a look at the abstract, and which is, I presume, why you're here, you'll know that I don't have the most um, optimistic uh, view about the state of Philippine democracy. Uh, and to illustrate um, why that is, I um, am happy to share uh, my research um, uh, using experimental methods and meta-analytic methods to understand uh, when voters uh, pose uh, a danger uh, to democracy, when they uh, might be um, unable to punish undemocratic behavior. So I'll talk a bit about uh, the problem, first of all, uh, which is backsliding, and then talk about uh, the experiment and some implications uh, to get um, for policymakers and NGOs and political parties to try to motivate um, voters uh, to act um, uh, pro-democratically. So uh, one of the uh, main problems that uh, a lot of democratization, comparative politics researchers have been focused on is this idea of, of backsliding. And uh, as you'll see here, uh, the um, uh, prevalence of backsliding is quite widespread across uh, many different regions. Uh, and backsliding uh, is defined here in this map as uh, a variety of a varieties of democracy expert coded decline in the independence of three major institutions uh, that comprise uh, what we think of as, as checks and balances. So, you know, there's quite a bit of it in Latin America, as we would expect, in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, South Asia and Southeast Asia. If you'll just note here, except for a sort of a puzzling uh, coding case uh, for Canada, um, there really isn't any interference in, in what we think of as, as long-standing or, or developed democracies. And it's this variation that I'm also interested uh, in explaining. Uh, and I try to do so by uh, comparing, uh, say, a, a very uh, highly backsliding case like the Philippines, as you can see here, um, to uh, non-backsliding cases like the US and, and European democracies. So, so here we see that uh, we see the conventional sort of cases that we think of, the qualitative researchers have highlighted. Uh, we see Turkey, we see India, and then we obviously see the Philippines. So the Philippines there uh, has uh, about seven um, backsliding events. So these are uh, annual, um, annually coded events, uh, declines in those three institutions. So since democratization, uh, the Philippines has had about seven country years where uh, institutions uh, have been attacked. And if we look more specifically about who is perpetrating uh, these um, uh, these assaults on institutions, uh, we can see sort of the usual culprits that we think of. And right there, highlighted in red, is uh, PDP Laban, 
uh, Philippines under uh, President uh, Rodrigo Duterte. So uh, you can see the number four, uh, that is the number of years um, where institutions have been uh, attacked um, between the onset of his presidency and 2020, which was the last coding year for this data set. So four years, that's almost every year of his presidency up until 2020, had these events and we can see you know other familiar faces in this list bolivia under eva morales rafael correa in ecuador um hungary victor orban uh, and then turkey akp under um erdogan before turkey was was downgraded um uh by the uh, borsch uh demo minimal democracy data set but the philippines is is really up there as a, a recent uh, acute case of of interference so this brings us to the research questions uh, that I have, which is, as Sol uh, kindly pointed out, which is, why do voters in some countries fail to punish executives who weaken institutional checks and balances? This is a, a very common question that you'll see in the literature and existing uh, survey experiments, control experiments, and survey data point to uh, voters being much more tolerant of co-partisans, um, people from the same party as them, uh, assaulting institutions, people are much more tolerant of that, as well as candidates uh, who have compatible policy preferences or ideologies. The question really is, is that many of these experiments have been conducted in Europe and the US, um, which, you know, have not encountered these sort of severe uh, institutional assaults like have uh, occurred in many of those countries highlighted in the map and in the Philippines. So the question really is, as well, how do the experimental estimates that we see in the literature how do they inform our verbal assessments about country risk uh, of experiencing sustained interference and, and who is at risk? And the crucial question being was, are these known moderators, partisan bias, policy congruence, are they strong enough in places like the Philippines um, to preclude voter punishment? And I argue that they're not strong enough. And crucially does telling voters about politicians, liberal and undemocratic behavior lead to enough voters punishing them? That is, um, would an intervention telling voters that a executive is undemocratic lead to that candidate losing when they otherwise uh, would have won? I mean, that's sort of the counterfactual that I think we're generally all interested in um, as political scientists and, um, and as people interested in, in defending democratic institutions. So the argument in brief uh, is that uh, to explain sort of the variation that we see in the map between new democracies experiencing backsliding and long-standing democracies not experiencing sort of those acute institutional assaults, I propose that, you know, new democracies have either low voter interest or capacity to punish illiberal and undemocratic political behavior. That is, my argument relates to higher bias. And therefore, they're less likely um, to uh, prevent undemocratic politicians uh, from taking office, and they're more likely to experience sustained interference in the long run. And so my, my argument uh, boils down to the, sort of these three propositions for sustained interference, which is low voter interest or capacity, voter supermajority support for the incumbent, and obviously uh, the secret third ingredient, which is incumbent motivations to interfere in the first place. So you need, um, for backsliding to take place, you need the incumbent to, to interfere. And that these conditions are, you know, necessary and jointly sufficient for explaining both the onset and the persistence of the of interference. And using the Philippines as a as a case study, I show that the the strength of in group bias explains passivity. So it isn't is it isn't that there's low voter interest in democracy; is that there's very high in group bias, co-partisan bias, which explains uh, voter passivity when interference takes place, despite voters, Duterte supporters included, actually preferring pro-democratic behavior. And this is what I call the partisan trap. People prefer um, their uh, their own party to be pro-democratic, uh, but they'll still tolerate it if the alternative means defecting to uh, one of the opposition parties. So this sort of plays into, this is very sort of specific elucidation of the mechanism for um, strong polarization being associated with uh, backsliding. So before I jump into explaining the conjoint uh, experimental design and then the results, I want to also clarify what I mean when I talk about um, democratic risk, and, and I think it's helpful to illustrate what a hypothetical maximally at-risk democracy uh, looks like. So a democracy, in my definition, is maximally at risk when 100% of voters support a single party or politician, uh, and that when you tell those voters or partisans uh, that that party or politician has undertaken illiberal or undemocratic policies or adopted illiberal or undemocratic positions, 
that 100% of voters on, and partisans remain loyal. So nothing really changes their mind when you tell them about a violation of democracy or democratic institutions. And so this really uh, leads to uh, this uh, sort of prediction that uh, democratic decline risk increases the more a democracy resembles this hypothetical maximally at-risk democracy. And I can sort of illustrate this visually uh, with some simulated data. Uh, so these are um, uh, just randomly um, created data for different countries with the x-axis being sort of uh, capturing this bias. So it's the proportion of uh, partisan subgroups who are loyal to their undemocratic co-partisan rather than defecting to the pro-democratic out-partisan. And we can see here that party two in country D uh, is furthest at the top. So they have a very high proportion of the voters in this hypothetical country D. So on the y-axis, we see the proportion of all voters. It's about 85%. And there's about 70%, 72% um, bias. So 72% will remain loyal. And it's country D uh, on this uh, this, uh, figure here uh, that is is most at risk. Close, uh, most closely resembles the, the, the hypothetical maximally at-risk democracy, where there's these other simulated countries like country A, country B, uh, are less at risk. Uh, they're less in this uh, in, in, the, in the top um, right-hand corner. So um, to try to uh, plot uh, these uh, all the real democracies on that kind of chart, we can use what are called conjoint or candidate choice experiments. So uh, in in these types of experiments, respondents are presented with multiple pairs of hypothetical candidates whose characteristics are randomized. And these characteristics can be really anything that the researcher believes is salient to voter decision making. For example, I've included gender, partisanship, um, policy positions and democracy positions, other experiments that I'll also show uh, in comparison with the with the Philippines results, uh, have a slightly f- more or slightly less, uh, but broadly speaking, this is what you know a lot of researchers believe are salient to voters, and I really just follow along uh, with this uh, with this design. So we can determine, uh, given that we're randomizing different characteristics, we can determine the effect of the other attributes on attitudes to democracy. So whether people will be more forgiving of undemocratic positions when it's associated with uh, a candidate who belongs to the same party as the respondent. And we collect questions, or I collect questions, uh, all these other uh, experiments collect questions um, on respondent partisanship and poli- policy positions before the experimental section so they can uh, match um, uh, the respondents uh, to uh, the candidate characteristics to see whether, say, for example, a candidate is from the same party as the respondent. And so I deployed my conjoint experiment in um, in April of 2022, just before the 2022 Philippines general election. And I was interested in uh, this case because it's one of the few cases where uh, there is um, where, where there's acute backsliding and voters seem very supportive. You know, and uh, Morales has been kicked out in Bolivia, um, uh, Correa um, um, and uh, Moreno were kicked out in Ecuador, and so the Philippines uh, was one of these uh, great cases to uh, deploy an experiment to see whether voters uh, act differently. Uh, in backsliding democracies versus non-backsliding democracies. So when when I ran the experiment, um, the main um, the main outcome of interest for my experiment and many others is uh, which candidate uh, respondents uh, prefer. So you can see here an example of a, a candidate pair and respondents rate multiple uh, candidate pairs, uh, and we can see uh, that I randomize gender, uh, partisanship, and that's measured by whether the hypothetical candidate supports Robredo or President Duterte. Um, Policy positions, uh, so I had policy positions on LGBT rights, uh, drug policy, um, and uh, COVID. Uh, and then on the last row, uh, democracy positions, and I'll um, and I'll go through this in the next slide. So what we're asking respondents to do is to uh, choose which candidate they like the most and which one they would select. And and this is um, the the whole purpose of this kind of experiment is to try to simulate how people uh, might um, act in 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 real elections by making hypothetical uh, by by making choices between hypothetical candidates. So these are the democracy positions that uh, were randomly assigned to different um, hypothetical candidates. We have neutral or pro-democratic positions. So the government should involve greater public consultation. Uh, The candidate served on several committees in the Congress. 
Uh, they worked with local governments to improve election administration, you know, rather benign things. And then the undemocratic position uh, captures many of the things that uh, happen um, in uh, backsliding countries and in the Philippines in particular. So there's a sort of proposal to uh, the candidate supports a proposal that will allow uh, elections to be unconstitutionally postponed, um, said the government should ignore a court decision. So you know, supporting judicial interference or the discretion, government's discretion to interfere. Uh, and then uh, the last one being relating to media, media interference, which is said the government should stop the press from investigating and publishing stories critical of the government. So these are sort of classic um, classic examples of illiberal and, and undemocratic positions that we that we see. And so uh, to get us back to uh, trying to plot uh, each of these uh, democracies on that uh, maximally at risk democracy graph, uh, we can uh, take from these uh, conjoint experiments uh, these uh, pairs uh, that resemble critical contests. So they uh, they have uh, there are pairs of candidates uh, which sort of resembles uh, this idea of democracy being on the ballot. So undemocratic incumbent versus pro democratic opposition. So these are cross party contests where they have opposing democratic positions, and we're trying to see you know how many. Uh, partisan respondents choose the undemocratic co-partisan as opposed to defecting to the pro-democratic pro opposition. And then we have uh, uh, a primary style contest where we remove um, partisan, the partisan bias um, element uh, to the experiment uh, by only uh, randomizing uh, the undemocratic position uh, between candidates from the same party. So we have sort of primary style contests like we see in the US. So these are within party contests where the candidates have opposing democratic positions. And ultimately, the question that we're interested in is are undemocratic informational treatments effective enough to prevent undemocratic politicians from being elected or staying in office? And I show uh, in the next slide that for the US um, and other sort of longstanding democracies, that's the case, but less so for new democracies. So this graph here uh, nests the Philippines results against a bunch of other similarly designed experiments um, from the US and the UK being in blue, long-standing democracies, and then red being new democracies. So you can see on the far right-hand side, we've got Duterte, uh, uh, Duterte supporters, uh, we've got uh, Czechia voters, um, voters from Mexico, parties from Mexico, partisans from Mexico. Uh, we've got the Labour Party, Conservative Party from the UK and the Republicans and Democrats from the US. And for Duterte supporters on the, on the far right end, we can see that about 67%, the, the marginal mean just means the percentage here, proportion, 67% of Duterte supporters um, remain loyal to an undemocratic uh, Duterte aligned candidate rather than choosing the pro-democratic um, Rob Rito candidate. For uh, the experiment that I replicated, whose design my experiment was based on, uh, which is further to the middle, uh, the Graham and Sfoli paper, which came out in APSR a few years ago, we can see that Republicans and Democrats in that experiment, um, by and large, um, remain loyal, but many defected. So about 55% of Democrats and Republicans in that experiment uh, remain loyal and many defected. And you have to remember that in uh, the US, uh, races are much tighter. Um, and 45% of Republicans and Democrats defecting to the opposite pro-democratic side, that's a lot. That's a lot of people. 67% um, uh, of Duterte supporters, uh, when they comprise such a large um, uh, block in the voting population, that is more concerning. And we see this illustrated in the graph here. So this is the graph that uh, I showed earlier um, for the maximally at-risk democracy, and we can see a similar plot here where uh, we see that Duterte uh, supporters declared, um, or 75% of, of my sample declared that they were supporters of, of Rodrigo Duterte, and 67% uh, of those uh, voters chose to stay with the uh, undemocratic Duterte aligned candidate rather than defect to the pro democratic Rob Rito candidate. So, so this is quite concerning. I mean, from, from this graph, uh, we, can, um, we can predict that all that would be really needed is the uh, incumbent, the uh, Duterte, uh, Marcos, who's inherited much of Duterte's support. Uh, all that would be needed is, is for the incumbent to um, effect illiberal and undemocratic policies. Uh, for that, uh, for those policies to largely go um, uh, unpunished. Uh, so 
whereas when we see, when we look at the Republicans and Democrats here, support is much lower and there's less bias. We can also see that many other new democracies, like in Czechia and Mexico, for example, have similar levels of bias, uh, but they comprise uh, a much lower percentage of, of uh, the voting uh, population. There are more independents um, in uh, Mexico, South Korea, and Czechia. I did not have independents. Uh, I had um, a sort of a forced choice uh, element. And so there are probably some discrepancies there. But the thing is, is that um, uh, said the 75% largely aligns with what we see in the opinion polls. So uh, when we get to the, uh, when I get here to the, the partisan trap element of this, uh, we can see that rather interestingly, that Duterte supporters are, are much like uh, Democrats and Republicans uh, in the US, in that when you remove the partisan um, element and you instead have partisans choose between pro and undemocratic same party candidates, that a minority choose the undemocratic um, same party candidate. So only 40% now of Duterte supporters choose the undemocratic Duterte aligned candidate as opposed to the pro democratic Duterte aligned candidate. And so this is very similar to Republicans and Democrats in the US. Uh, which shows, you know, that this partisan bias is, is quite strong and that when we remove this uh, within party copartisan um, element in the experiment, that people actually choose pro-democratically. They prefer pro-democratic candidates in within party contests. It's only when we give people the option, um, when we force them uh, to make a choice between their own candidate and the out party, that people largely stay loyal uh, to uh, their party. And we can see this uh, is the case for many of the new democracies, except for, as we see, Marina in Mexico and the Democratic Party uh, in Korea. I mean, there are slightly differences in design, um, but you know, largely, uh, largely speaking, these uh, these partisans uh, reliably choose uh, pro-democratic within party candidates. And so to go back to the Philippines here, um, the risk of democratic decline, I think, is rather acute. We can see here that in my experiment, we found that 75% of people declared support for Duterte. And this is reflected in the polling data. This is data scraped from Wikipedia from a variety of pollsters. We can see that 75% approval for Duterte throughout his presidency, and that Marcos has largely inherited this from the polling data that we um, can see uh, thus far. So this is a uh, rather concerning given that there's at least um, large declared support for Marcos. There might be some social desirability bias here, but there is very strong support. If we look at the uh, presidential and vice presidential polls for 2022, we can see that Sara Duterte, uh, Duterte's daughter is also very popular. So uh, when she formally uh, said that she wasn't running for the presidency and declared her support or alliance with, with Marcos, uh, Marcos's um, support shot up, and I think he got just under 60% of the vote. And Sara Duterte, when she uh, became his running mate, uh, she exploded in popularity uh, and finished, I think, just over 60%. So, uh, you know, these, these voting numbers don't differ all that much from uh, the approval numbers. And I think it's concerning that if, you know, Sarah uh, becomes president one day and she there is no sort of drastic decline in her support, there'll also be similar um, risks for democratic decline in the Philippines. And just to wrap the presentation up here um, by discussing the implications for democratic stability, uh, it, it's, it's quite clear to me that telling Duterte and Marcos supporters about the undemocratic attitudes of their co-partisans is unlikely to change enough people's minds when the alternative is having to choose uh, an, an out party, uh, when, the, when the only alternative is, is defecting one's support to uh, the opposition. So that leads me to conclude that, well, stronger treatments are needed. Just telling people about the undemocratic attitudes of politicians isn't enough. And I also don't explore in this experiment uh, the undemocratic rationalizations or justification processes of incumbents. We know that uh, when uh, illiberal undemocratic executives uh, do illiberal and undemocratic things, that they usually try to couch um, their actions in democratic language. So this is uh, so this. So it may be that you know uh, support or tolerance will be higher. Also, survey experiments like I've shown here. Uh, likely overestimate treatment effects compared to field experiments. So field experiments where the treatments are run in real elections, where this is just a survey experiment online. Everyone is exposed to the informational treatment, barring variation in attentiveness, 
um, in a survey experiment. That isn't likely to be true in, in the real world. People might be treated with informational um, with informational interventions, either by TV or uh, through the newspapers. Um, but there's obviously um, going to be variation in what people are exposed to or what people what you can get people to notice. There are also no time lags in survey experiments. So people might be exposed to a treatment, but in the real world, it might be days or weeks before people actually go out and vote. So the, the real world um, treatment effects uh, are likely to be smaller than what we see, and therefore the bias and the percentage of people that will remain with the undemocratic incumbent is likely to be higher than what we see here in the survey experiment. So actually, the survey experiment here is actually probably a conservative estimate um, or a very optimistic assessment about how many people will actually defect. So when I spoke about stronger interventions being uh, needed, there are some promising research on uh, using video treatments to get people to think more about um, the consequences of illiberal and undemocratic actions. So there's research from the US, a, a mega study from Stanford on this. There are also framing devices that we can use. So we can try to uh, provide evidence that uh, these illiberal and unde undemocratic activities um, are likely to enhance the corruption of executives. So uh, there's, I believe, some work on this in, in Hungary, um, and there are examples where, you know, Viktor Orban has been, um, uh, has, has used his power um, in, in less than transparent ways to advance his own uh, business interests or those of his friends. And so, you know, those kinds of framing devices may work. There's also political canvassing as well, where we try to uh, get people to um, confront uh, the liberal and undemocratic activities of the incumbent by having canvassers directly talk to people. Um, so these are sort of potential stronger treatments rather than just being exposed to simple sentences. To conclude here, I believe that you know the research on experimental pro-democratic interventions is still developing, it's still rather new, uh, and that obviously more collaboration is required um, between experimentalists, uh, qualitative and area scholars, and ultimately NGOs and political parties who will probably be uh, implementing these kinds of interventions um, in the field. Uh, in psychology, there's um, a much uh, a greater emphasis on big collaborations, um, between researchers. And I think that's what's needed if we're going to try to develop um, reliable, long-lasting pro-democratic interventions in democracies uh, in the Philippines um, and beyond. So thank you very much uh, for listening. Um, it's been a pleasure to present my research to you. I look forward to your questions. Great. Thank you so much, Berman. Really interesting, really interesting work uh, on, um, on uh, this notion of uh, a, a partisan trap. Okay, uh, we have uh, some time, uh, just a little under half an hour more for questions, comments, and uh, further discussion. Could I invite uh, the members of the audience to please uh, use the Q&A box? Let's see if there's anyone in the chat. Yes, uh, while we're waiting, perhaps I could take the prerogative of moderating and just ask Berman, could you talk more about that, um, the, the, this, this idea of um, in-group bias or this partisan trap, right? Uh, what, 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 just just tell, a little, tell us a little bit more about what it means, both conceptually and the sort of evidence you find in the Philippines. Um, Especially, I would say, in terms of uh, does it does it matter if the uh, party system institutionalization in your case is weak? Like, what counts as partisan is uh, partisan behavior and voter loyalty? Uh, absolutely. So, um, so just to to talk more about this partisan trap idea, it's it's just the idea that um, people prefer their own side to be pro democratic. Uh, but when people are faced with uh, the alternative um, of defecting to sort of a pro-democratic or transitioning their support to a pro-democratic opposition candidate, many people choose to stay loyal. So, you know, there are no primary contests in the Philippines, but we can see that in those kinds of contests, in the, uh, when, when respondents, Duterte supporters, are faced with the opportunity to select a pro-democratic candidate from their own side versus an undemocratic uh, candidate from their own side, that they overwhelmingly choose 
uh, choose the pro-democratic candidate. So people choose uh, pro-democratically when we remove um, this uh, trade-off between supporting their own side um, versus defecting to the other side. So, you know, I don't think um, there's uh, any real chance of, of the Philippines adopting uh, primary style systems, as, as you say, uh, partisanship is weak. Uh, and to address that point, um, because, you know, partisan affiliation that we usually think of in the US, you know, Democrat and Republican labels aren't very strong, I chose to use um, uh, the hypothetical candidates being um, uh, uh, being supporters of the president or not, right? Because there's weak institutionalization, uh, party institutionalization, that doesn't mean that people aren't partisans, it's just the nature of partisan attachment is different uh, in the Philippines. And I believe, I think I saw Steve uh, Rood uh, is in the audience. He was the one that gave me <laughs> this idea uh, of operationalizing, of, of using uh, partisan um, loyalty to the president as the way of, of sort of separating uh, voters. And as we can see that my measure of partisanship nicely lines up with the at least declared support for the president in those polls. So 75% in my sample said that they uh, preferred Duterte to uh, Robredo, and that's what we see. Um, that's what we see in the polls. So, I, you know, I think that's a, a sort of a rather compelling example of the validity of this measurement. I'm, I'm glad I didn't uh, decide to use party labels uh, because I, I don't know how different the results would have been. And and I, I've seen instances where uh, people who study the Philippines have been criticised for relying on party labels as opposed to uh, using sort of uh, personalities uh, as sort of the defining. Um, uh, feature of of partisanship in in the Philippines. So hopefully that answers your question about why I chose Duterte Robredo as opposed to in these other experiments, uh, which use party labels uh, to differentiate um, the different uh, different groups and cleavages. Indeed, uh, and uh, yes, you mentioned Steve Root is in the audience. I've also noticed a number a number of um, other uh, experts on the Philippines and um, democracy in the region. Uh, democracy and authoritarianism in the region as well in our audience. So I hope that you'll give uh, us the uh, benefit of your expertise uh, and um, raise some comments, uh, some questions, perhaps some suggestions. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, uh, I'd also like to think about the timing of your of your your experiment. Now, April April 2022 just before, just on the cusp of the, of the May elections last year. And your findings, 67% chose the Duterte-aligned undemocratic candidate, very similar to the actual Robredo uh, Marcos Jr. matchup. So could you comment on your findings, you know, just help for our audience, help to translate the sort of results of your experiment and tease out some of the implications Related to, as you say, you know the the the, the sort of uh, presidential approval uh, of the incumbent at the time, but also, of course, in terms of the 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 May twenty twenty two elections, if if you if you could draw out further some of those implications, um, and the fact that, of course, Duterte himself was not on the ballot uh, given the 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 term limit to to one term. Uh, yeah, could you, you talk a little bit more about your findings? Absolutely. So when um, when I was designing this experiment, um, I was faced with the choice of of using uh, Marcos uh, and Robredo versus Duterte um, uh, and Robredo, and I and I chose Duterte mainly because he was still president, and because I think there was a pretty good um, uh, there was a pretty good connection between who would support. Uh, Duterte and who would support Marcos, uh, given the alliance between Marcos and uh, Sara Duterte. Um, uh, you know, we can see that the support levels are, are pretty uh, are pretty comparable. So if I can just go back to this slide here, uh, looking at the uh, approval rates, uh, we can see that, you know, Duterte was very popular uh, throughout uh, his presidency, 75%, I think, generally speaking, um, his approval was at. And then Marcos has largely inherited that. And uh, I don't know what kinds of crises um, would have to happen uh, for uh, people to uh, defect, uh, to start disapproving of Marcos. But for now, you know, he has um, quite high support. And, and 
as my argument goes, when there's, you know, high support, this super majority of support for Marcos, we already know that we can see in the experiment that there's sort of very high bias, uh, co-partisan bias, uh, there's high loyalty to Marcos, even when you tell people about, um, even when you may tell people about un his undemocratic opinions or maybe future undemocratic um, actions, I predict that, you know, if he does anything to attack institutions, that we'll see a, re a repeat of, of what happened under Duterte, where, you know, there are some protests, uh, people um, uh, obviously disapprove, but uh, there won't be uh, any uh, large shifts away uh, from uh, Marcos um, like, the, like there wasn't for, for Duterte. So, you know, I, I largely have sort of pessimistic uh, opinions here. Um, but, you know, I, I have to say, you know, this is this is all assuming that the validity of the experimental results um, and uh, and obviously, you know, these results uh, may change. Uh, they, you know, we need replications. Um, we need the incorporation of, you know, other pieces of evidence, survey evidence, qualitative evidence uh, to uh, back up uh, whether this pessimistic conclusion is, is warranted. And I, and I think there is a generally a pessimistic conclusion, but I just wanted to highlight that there, there are opportunities. I mean, uh, experimentalists, um, I think, you know, might have uh, an opportunity here to try to test uh, what kinds of pro-democratic interventions uh, may work going forward. And, and that's, uh, I think that's my main interest, given that we don't see very encouraging results um, as it stands. Yeah, good. Thank you so much, uh, Raymond. We do have a question from Mark Thompson. Uh, the City University of Hong Kong. Uh, can you talk more about how voters know that their candidates are anti-democratic? Executive aggrandizement is often hard to detect, particularly if elections remain free, if not entirely fair, press freedom, press freedom to some extent, the right, of, the right to protest, and even the drug war itself framed as a law enforcement effort that protects ordinary citizens rather than violating human rights. Uh, yes, uh, th thank you uh, very much for um, the question. So I I'm just going to have a look at this again. So can you talk more about how voters know that their candidates are anti-democratic? Okay. Uh, so in the real world, uh, not everybody is exposed to information that their preferred candidate, so Duterte supporters, when he was president, weren't always exposed to information that he did illiberal or undemocratic things. And if they were, um, there are all kinds of justifications that the party, uh, uh, that um, elite supporters of Duterte and Duterte himself used uh, to justify um, these actions as, as being legitimate. So, you know, it's, it's actually, you know, hard to say, uh, it's hard to say that people are, are consistently treated with this kind of information in, in the real world. Uh, so the bias and the loyalty, the percentage that would transition away from the incumbent is likely to be much smaller than what we see in this experiment here. So in this experiment, everybody sees um, the information that a candidate, you know, aligned with Duterte has um, has an undemocratic or liberal position. Um, that isn't the case in, in the real world. And, and obviously there's all kinds of obfuscation um, and all kinds of confusion, misinformation and so forth um, that leads to people uh, not recognizing that something is illiberal and undemocratic. Um, you know, this kind of experiment is really aimed at testing uh, how people react when they see this information presented to them. And even when people see this in the context of a survey experiment, you know, people online doing these kinds of surveys, um, even when we tell them directly, uh, not that many people and not enough people um, choose the other side. And that's a very low cost decision as well, right? Uh, people see the information and they can immediately choose the pro-democratic opposition candidate with a, just a, a click of a mouse or, or a tap on their phone. Um, in the real world, that likely isn't true. Um, and there are all kinds of reasons why people would uh, not be exposed to this information, why they would uh, reinterpret this information as being legitimate, or just not paying attention um, and not realizing or not choosing to engage with these things. So, you know, this is this is a sort of a very optimistic result, and and the result isn't good. <laughs> you know, one would think that people would be much more willing to punish in the context of a survey experiment, but they but they don't. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you for that. We have another question uh, from Mary Rosales of Ateneo de Melilla University. Does not backsliding imply that those who voted for Duterte are less democratic and knowledgeable? Cannot one view the situation as an implicit protest against the ways they are looked down upon by upper middle class groups? The only way in which they are equal with the higher class groups and can thus act as peers lies in their ability to vote. This cultura divide, as pointed out by Marco Garrido in his Patchwork City and Wataru Kusaka in his Moral Politics, point to this qualitative alienation from the higher classes who regard them as duped, uninformed, and quote unquote bad people, uh, particularly the urban poor, when they see themselves as striving and trying to make a better life for their families. Could you comment on that? Uh, yeah, so uh, if, if I um, understand the, the question correctly, uh, there is uh, this this alienation, uh, class alienation dynamic, um, if that's right, Sol, uh, which can you know lead people to support uh, illiberal, undemocratic positions. Um, w w would that be right? I mean, I'm just yeah. trying to read the question yeah. uh, again and, myself here. And in a way, uh, one in a way, the interpretation of voting for an undemocratic leader uh, is uh, basically people's exercise because the largest voting class, of course, are. Uh, Poorer voters. This, yeah. this is the, the the sort of pyramid of uh, of um, class across voters, and uh, by by voting for someone like Duterte, right? Uh, that is that is their their vote. You know, exercising their agency and the sort of protest vote against how they are looked down upon. Um, I suppose uh, the question also here is like, where does this leave us? You know, how do you, how would you uh, evaluate the notion of democratic backsliding against um, the sort of activation of uh, of uh, this kind of sentiment among among voters, particularly poorer voters, who are basically voting against the status quo in many ways. Uh, one, yeah, one uh, absolutely. Narrative that that came out in the last election was Duterte uh, in the 2016 election, rather when Duterte was actually elected, was that sort of a vote for Duterte was a vote against that post etsa post dictatorship consensus that didn't really result in a material uh, change for people, uh, you know. And uh, yeah, well, why don't you why don't you go ahead and comment? Yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, I really appreciate the question. Um, it's a, another example of of uh, good sort of qualitative observation informing, you know, why people don't act in the ways that we would want them to act, which is to consistently choose um, liberal and, and pro-democratic candidates. Um, uh, I I think that the argument is is very compelling uh, and plausible and you know can also explain um much of this loyalty uh to to Duterte and the unwillingness say to uh, defect to a liberal candidate that you know doesn't represent um you know their own uh people's you know poorer voters own um political views and, and aspirations uh I think that there's a lot of room for uh this kind of uh, qualitative um, understanding of, of voter sentiment to inform the development of uh, pro-democratic interventions. Um, identifying exactly what people's preferences and biases are, I think, is really the, the only way to create potentially long-lasting or, or, or effective interventions. I'm not, you know, uh, I, I'm open to the idea that there's nothing really that social scientists can do uh, to change enough people's minds. Um, I'm saying that uh, you know we need these kinds of uh, unique perspectives, case-informed perspectives, to try to develop something, to try to test something, to see whether it it changes enough people's minds. So I really appreciate the question. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I think it's more of also yeah something something for you to 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 also consider and think about. Uh, and in 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 connection with that, uh, in the 2022 election, actually Marcus Jr as a sort of surrogate for um, uh, supporters for Duterte, as you say, he sort of inherited uh, inherited uh, that kind of 
uh, high levels of, of or ostensibly high levels of approval for, for uh, Duterte. But it's a complicated picture because Marcos Jr. wasn't actually Duterte's anointed successor. Uh, you know, it, and uh, Sarah Duterte, by being Marcos's running mate, probably, you know, uh, played that sort of function of some very strange, uh, you know, notion of this is the continuity ticket, right? And therefore support for Duterte would be sort of uh, support for Marcos as, as, as well. Um, I don't know if you have any, any thoughts about that because Duterte actually explicitly criticized Marcos Jr. Uh, in the course of the, in, in the course of the, the uh, filing of candidacy period and, and, and during the campaign as well. Uh, do you think this could play, could, could have any impact at all on um, you conducting your survey, uh, your experiment rather, um, so close to the election and during that period? Yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. Um, there's uh, obviously, uh, you know, these unique sort of political dynamics that, uh, you know, people that run these experiments don't always uh, consider, uh, that we avoid sort of these nuances. Um, you know, like I said, the, the, the sort of the point of choosing the Philippines was to try to understand how uh, voters, um, or whether voters in these kinds of backsliding democracies, um, whether they behave differently from the US. And you know, just the, the the use of the Duterte label as opposed to the Marcos label, um, uh, I think was, you know, I think is defensible uh, and valid, especially since at that point, uh, like you say, you know, the Marcos Duterte ticket had already been um, established. So I think when people saw Duterte line candidate, um, they would also presume that that such a such a hypothetical candidate would also uh, be a Marcos aligned one uh, when the time came for a transition of power. These are obviously untestable assumptions, of course. So, um, <laughs> you know, but, you know, we can we can we can see that, um, you know, the the approval sort of matches. And and as you can see in the slide here, you know, uh, Marcos's approval sort of picked up where Duterte left off. Uh, so, you know, obviously, these kinds of external validity claims um, are uh, you know, claims that we just have to uh, believe or approve of. Um, but we can we do see uh, parallels in the data that can, you know, update our confidence that, you know, this kind of measure uh, did indeed capture the basic political voter dynamics in, in the Philippines. So, yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, uh, obviously, um, obviously, these are persistent problems in 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 survey experiments, you know, you, you can't do it all. <laughs> Although, as I was, uh, I, there, there is uh, some research, as I mentioned before, that I'm doing, and I think some others in the who are currently with us also doing on you know, being able to also be skeptical of um, uh, presidential approval ratings uh, in the country, especially in the context of democratic backsliding in recent years. We have a couple more uh, comments and questions. Uh, Steve Rood says, respondents may indeed not see quote unquote illiberal actions as undemocratic. In the 2018 Asian barometer round in a forced choice and essential characteristics of a democracy, basic necessities provided for all is a top choice at, of 29% of respondents thought that basic necessities provision is an essential characteristic of democracy. So rather than procedural uh, uh, notions of democracy, for instance. Uh, you feel free to comment on that if you would like, but I'll go ahead to the next question, which is related on how you do, how you define democracy. So Balsas Kovacs says, I would argue uh, uh, I would argue that the Philippines is not a democracy, a system of popular sovereignty, but an oligarchy where oligarchy competition is mostly, though not entirely, channeled into elections. I think this may inform voters. For example, I have found in my research that vote selling is not a result of voters' lack of knowledge or understanding of their political system, but rather the opposite. They do know that it is one of the few actual benefits they are likely ever to get from elections, as Mary Rosales also pointed out, uh, or similarly pointed out. In the same vein, it might be, it may be less loyalty to, to Duterte and Marcos 
Though I believe you are right, the phenomenon does exist, but a continuing protest vote against the post-EDSA elite democracy, which Robredo represented, despite her attempts to change color from yellow to pink. So yeah, a sort of similar, similar question, but at least could you, could you talk a little bit more about how you define democracy within the, within the parameters of your study to clarify this? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, you know, when I, my, my measurements of democracy, if we can just uh, allow me to just go back to uh, the slides here, you know, it's a very uh, conventional uh, set of measures that have been used in a variety of those experiments. So when I show the, the big graph uh, with all those estimates from different parties and different countries, they broadly had these kinds of, um, these kinds of measures. And I chose them to also be able to compare the Philippines' results to other countries like the U.S., for example. Uh, so, yeah, I, I absolutely, uh, I absolutely agree with the with the with the assessment that you know material um, material conditions, uh, people's poverty, uh, the promises, redistributive promises uh, of elites matter a lot. Um, clientelism obviously factors into uh, voter choices and decision making in real elections. Um, which is obviously not captured here. Um, I'm not engaging in any kind of um, attempts to uh, uh, persuade people, you know, that there's no sort of hypothetical payoff or something, you know, these kinds of dynamics uh, are not captured um, in this kind of experiment. Uh, so, you know, just to speak about the the undemocratic attributes, I mean, we, we've got classic media interference, um, interference with uh, elections, uh, postponing elections, and then um, ignoring court decisions. Um, so, of course, you know, people might not see these as particularly inconsistent uh, with democracy um, as elections. If, if people have a very uh, procedural definition uh, of, uh, of democracy, that it is merely just um, casting one's ballot, uh, then, these, uh, then these won't really be a problem. Uh, the thing is, though, is that, well, we, we see that when we remove sort of the, the co-partisan element is that people would much rather have candidates with those neutral or pro-democratic positions than those undemocratic ones. So, you know, the, the obviously the, the competing uh, perspective, theoretical perspective, is that Filipinos uh, don't differentiate between the pro and undemocratic positions. Uh, that they they don't care, um, and it doesn't really matter, and they won't differentiate them. But we do see that. Um, we do see them differentiating these people, you know, in those within party contests, the vast majority of them, 60% of them, um, much like Republicans and Democrats, uh, choose the neutral or pro-democratic candidates over the undemocratic ones. So it's not as though they don't uh, like, um, they don't like uh, or can't differentiate uh, undemocratic from pro-democratic, which is something that I sort of entertained a bit uh, th before I ran this study. And some people sort of told me, well, maybe they won't be able to because of X, Y, Z uh, reasons. But, you know, we don't see that. Th th there is the ability to differentiate and to discriminate uh, between these positions. Um, vote buying, um, these kinds of uh, clientless networks, I think, ultimately play a, a big role when it comes to people choosing uh, which candidate to vote for um, at the ballot box and may interfere with um, willingness to defect. You know, um, payoffs and clientelism can obviously, um, in the real world, uh, mitigate uh, the uh, the desire um, or the willingness to defect to the opposition candidate, as does resentment, um, and as does a belief that, say, uh, the incumbent um, cares more about their problems than, say, uh, the the liberal candidate or the the traditional elite candidate. Uh, so, I mean, th these are all sort of uh, explanations for why we see the lack of punishment in the real world. And I think it sort of nicely complements the findings that uh, that not enough people, you know, very not that many people, um, Duterte supporters, Marco supporters, will will defect if the alternative is. Uh, one of the, say, liberal um, opposition candidates. I mean, a, a may maybe a compelling story would be, or solution would be to implement these kinds of um, uh, within party uh, primary style contests. I didn't really see that as a possibility, but, you know, that is maybe something that will happen. But I mean, given the, the prevalence of personality um, uh, and, you know, elite networks uh, in Philippines politics, I don't see any kind of formalization uh, like that happening. Um, 
but but still, uh, you know, the positive thing is is that people can discriminate, and and that's what I find very encouraging about this. It's just that we don't know how to motivate enough people when defection to the other party is the only option. So thank you very much for for those two questions. Yeah. Um, oh, good, thank you. And uh, we have probably have time for one very quick. Uh, one, the, I see that Mark Thompson's raising his hand, and I know Mary Rosales wanted to add comments, but we need to see them in the uh, Q&A box, please, because we are unable due to the, the format uh, to, to uh, let people um, ask their questions uh, on video. So uh, is anyone going to add something to the webinar chat? Let me see. Ah, okay. Uh, there are a couple more of uh, more comments. Uh, there's a thank you to you. Okay, Mark's question is already answered. So Mary Rosales has uh, an additional comment. As we are an elite democracy, maybe the problem lies in the elite upper middle class's inability or unwillingness to understand or interact as peers with the lower with lower class voters. Their criteria appear biased in favor of elite values. For the urban poor democracy. Uh, means being treated with respect and dignity, or perhaps as Steve Root pointed out, it means um, fulfilling basic needs. Until they feel those who are who guard the uh, liberal democracy domain understand and practice this, social class will continue to be a key point of division. Okay, I think that is, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mary, for, for, for this comment. Uh, Berman, could I just ask you to perhaps just say a few final words to close us, uh, to close today? Yes, um, absolutely. To, to that point, I totally agree with, with Mary's assessment. Maybe one of the solutions as, as somebody who's, you know, rather removed from this, uh, maybe one of the solutions is to, uh, you know, champion a pro-democratic, uh, opposition candidate that has those, um, has the aspirations of working people at heart um, and to to really promote these kinds of um, you know instrumental reforms that that people are interested in as well as having pro-democratic uh, positions so you know I'm, I'm I I'll leave it to the country experts to to make diagnostics about what <laughs> Filipino politicians should and shouldn't do um, but I think there's, you know, uh, you know, in addition to all these factors, I think there is room for the development of further development of pro-democratic in interventions. Um, and I'm very optimistic about it. And I look forward to uh, continuing to talk to country experts about this. Just to close off um, my final slide here, which I didn't get to, uh, I'd just like to thank everybody uh, who attended. I'd like to thank you, Sol, for sharing this. It's greatly appreciated. Uh, any queries and suggestions can be sent to me via email. You can reach me on Twitter. You can read more about the preprint and my comparison with all these other countries on SciArchive, and the links and the details can be found at my personal website, uh, as you can see there, bowanscoggins.com. So thank you very much uh, to everybody. Thank you for your questions. It was a, a very engaging and, and helpful process. So. Yeah. Much, much appreciated. Yes, thank you. Good luck with uh, the rest of your candidacy. Mary Rosales does suggest to read Garrido and Kusaka, which I, I do second as, an, as, a, as, a, as a suggestion. Um, this has been the Philippine Social Science Seminar Series, or Philip, uh, Phil S4. Thank you so much to our co-organizers, co uh, the Sydney Southeast Asia Center and the City University of Hong Kong. I'm Saul Iglesias from the University of the Philippines uh, in Diliman's uh, Political Science Department. Please join us again next month. Uh, we'll have uh, more, more uh, discussions on a monthly basis. And thank you everyone. Good evening, good morning, and good afternoon, depending on where you are. Goodbye, thank you. <laughs>